Get the inside track on 20 top business trends for 2020 from Joel Block. Joel's insights bring Wall Street to your street so you can profit from the inside in 2020. Just text the word TREND to 72000. That's 72000. And download your free copy today. Grab your phone and get the inside track on business trends that affect you and your business. Just text the word TREND to 72000 for your copy now. This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Insights to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. What marketing strategies and tactics can I implement right now that my competitors are not doing that will give me a leg up? To answer that question, Doug Morneau. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. So happy to be here and joining you today. Well, this is cool. So you kind of uh, operate in an area that's my background. You operate in the venture capital space, but you don't do venture capital work. You support the VC guys in, in a bunch of capacities, right? Yeah, I support them and the projects they invest in, sometimes help them to make sure there's liquidity, sometimes they help them make sure they sell the products. So how do you do that? You're not actually on the money side per se, are you? I'm not, but I do try to get close to the money guys. I found the best way to to run my business was get as close to the money guys as I can and as close to the media guys as possible to cut out all the people in between. So there's less finger pointing. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, one of the things that I've always said, I write about these things in my book and talk about this often is that uh, the people closest to the money make the most money. And that's just kind of the way it works. So <laughs> yep. the guys in the venture business, the Wall Street guys, they make the most money and that's just kind of how it works. So so what exactly do you do? What what service do you provide these venture guys or, or other clients? Well, typically we start looking at the strategy. So they have a problem. The problem is we need to raise money. We need the stock price to reflect you know, the value of the company because we're going to do another public raise. We need to sell a product. So we'll come and look at what the problem is. And then I will write sort of a prescription, if you will, on this is the way we should solve that problem. And you're a marketing guy, right? I mean, so you're, we're talking about marketing solutions. We're yeah, not we're talking about marketing. Like, How can we move the sales dial, get leads, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, and not necessarily always by paid, but what, what do we need to do to make it work? And what kinds of deals are you talking about? Uh, are these early stage companies? Are these mid-range deals? I mean, uh, you know, what, what are we talking about? They're typically early stage and they, they run across every sort of industry you could possibly think about. So most of them are publicly traded and these guys are looking at investing money. So they're looking at, okay, now, you know, the founders are there, but they're not getting any traction. So they're looking for VC money. Um, how can we make this work for them? And most of the time when I think about these things, I'm thinking about, you know, raising money. Uh, so you're not involved in the raising money part. You're involved in helping the underlying company, the, the, the actual business that they've invested in to be more successful. That's kind of what you're thinking about. Do both. I'll do both. So if, if they need liquidity in the marketplace, they need to people show up and call their brokers or call these guys if it's a private placement or a real estate deal, I will run programs and strategies that will get individual investors to call in, sign up and request more okay, information. So let's, let's talk about uh, that first, because listen, that's been my business for 30 years is working with private investors, private placements, the whole thing, raising money like the same way. How do you contribute to that process? Um, typically, I will, you know, once we figure out who the target audience is, I'll give you a specific example. So I had a company in uh, California, close to obviously where you are, approached me and they had a heart pump. It was a replacement for um, a child's heart. It was a temporary replacement until they get a transplant and they wanted to raise some capital. So what I did was I put together a marketing program that was a email based with a landing page and content that went out to cardiologists. The thinking was the cardiologists would understand the technology. The cardiologists are making money and they could likely use the product in the hospital. So we're trying to, you know, get uh, get people to take it and try it, get people to invest. And so that was the whole focus was reaching these cardiologists in their inbox and saying, hey, here's a new technology. This company is, is a public company. They're looking to raise capital and expand. I can't tell you how often. I mean, I mean, literally every single day I get contacted by somebody saying, can you help me raise money? I, I got this. I got that. Uh, I got one last night that, you know, it was a uh, kind of what I would call an affinity program. In other words, where cardiologists, where it's very easy to identify people who might be interested. 
And this was the same thing. This was like a nutrition thing or a health thing or a side. I forget what it was. I, I see literally so many. Without getting technical, how do you actually go about approaching these investors? I mean, you're, you can't solicit them. Uh, you know, they have to be high net worth people. I mean, so what, what rules are you operating under and how are you doing this? Well, I mean, we're following obviously the rules uh, that are laid out for whether it's crowdfunding or if it's public SEC and FINRA. And so what we're doing first is identifying the target audience. So who are most likely people that will resonate with your message? So yes, we're going to take it as taken for granted that they're online, that they're already subscribing to financial newsletters because we know that and that they may be interested in the affinity, whatever you've got. In a lot of cases, we can't get that granular. So we're just saying, hey, here's a group of, pick a number, 300,000 people who subscribe to Zach's Financials website so we know what sort of data they're receiving from Zach's. And then I, I call my media guys at Zach's and we will run a sponsored email or an email ad in one of Zach's mailings. So, you know, Zach's has the relationship. Um, they're already mailing these guys daily. The difference is the one day that I've contracted them, they send your message. So it's your message, your company that goes out to them. And what what are you asking the people to do? Let's say it's a cardiologist. That's a great example for a, for a heart product. Now that's a venture deal, but it could be a real estate deal and said, it doesn't matter. So what are you asking them to do? Are they going to a, a web page to sign up to get more information? What, what, what What's the next step that you take them through? It depends on the, what the client's end goal is, but generally it's to build a list of people that are interested in the company or the product and then give them kind of an investment snapshot. So sometimes we'll have an analyst report that will go there. Um, we'll have some industry details. And so often the copy can be very long because there's a lot of information there. So we realized that, you know, like you said, you can't solicit. People aren't going to put their credit card in and buy buy a stock or buy a, a property or project like that over the internet. So what they're going to do is they're going to investigate and go look deeper. So what we want to do is give them some information, say, is this something you'd be interested in? And then direct them to where they can get some more information. Are you involved in any of these crowdfunding deals like uh, the Reggae Plus deals or, you know, the uh, any of the other stuff? The five Yeah, the, we, I've uh, worked with a couple of companies in that space where we took the same approach. So the reason why I use email is a couple of ways. If you think back to your question at the very beginning of the show was how can you how can you create this marketing opportunity that your competitor is seeing? Um Email, permission-based email is is well-known in our industry, but it's not necessarily well-known in the marketplace. So we can identify hundreds of thousands of people. So sales is a numbers game. So you obviously want to target the right people, but you don't want to go talk to 10 people. You maybe want to go talk to 200,000 people. So no, that's why we go that space. Especially for capital raising of a unique, easily identifiable, affinity-oriented project. I, I've always thought that Crowdfunding, especially the Reg A Plus offerings, work the best for people that have some affinity to a concept. Yep. You know, it just to me that always made sense. I, I don't think that other people have always seen it that way. One after the next, though, the ones that fail, uh, they're just reaching out to anybody about anything, and and, and that's not a, a winning formula. Well, you can layer data. So, to your health example, um, you know, I'm launching a health and wellness site uh, in the next the year. And I've already identified some of the media I'm going to buy. So to give you an idea, one of the lists is about 600,000 people that have raised their hands that are looking for a solution to a health problem. So I know they're going to want to receive that. If I was raising capital, I could lay, overlay that list um, with the same publisher to people who have subscribed to their investment newsletter. So I could see people who are interested in investing and are also interested in health. And then maybe another layer that says, give me the ones that have more money than other people. Right. Yeah. I mean, so the, the data world is advancing. The email world is advancing. There's there's all sorts of tools that we're using now in terms of artificial intelligence for writing copy and content and testing subject lines in advance based on previous, you know, uh, 25,000 emails that went out to the same type of audience with, you know, 60 million subscribers. So which is going to work best? So it's become a lot more sophisticated. And when I started, it was just, hey, you, you rent the list just kind of like you buy an ad in the newspaper. Now, fast forward to today, we've got remarketing and retargeting. So we go out to use the Zach's example again. We go to 300,000 people. You know, maybe they have a 15% open rate. All those people who have opened and hit the landing page, we can now remarket uh, over and over and over again on, on Google and on Facebook. So we don't have to rent that same data, uh, but we have a chance to remarket them with an ad to take the next step. You know, I've heard of these things. I've heard of retargeting. 
Tell me exactly what is it? I'm not quite certain that I understand exactly what that means when you say retargeting. So 15% of the people open the email. Now what happens? Well, if the, there's, there's a couple tracking technology. So I can track people who opened it and retarget them. Meaning if you've opened it and you go shopping, you're, you're web browsing, you're looking at whatever you're looking at online, you're looking at the baseball scores. I can put an ad on the MLB website that only you would see because you open that email. So really it's a second whack. Yeah. You're, you're, you're whacking them again is what, what you're saying. Yeah. And, and what you're going to do is whack them over and over and over and over again, as many times as you can, because you only pay when someone clicks. So you came, you got the email, you opened it up, you went, yeah, kind of interesting. Then you closed it. You got busy, didn't think about it. You go to the MLB, check the, the Dodger score, see who's who's playing next, whatever, there's an ad. You see it again. And then you go off and you're looking at, oh, hey, what's happening? Um, what's happening at our local scene downtown? Looking for concerts. Hey, there's the ad again. So you're seeing this reinforcement of you what know, you've already seen. The thing is, to me, the consumer, I'm sitting going, because this happening to me like all the time. Like yeah. I'm looking at buying this subscription service, a really kind of a cool thing, and, and I'm investigating it. You yeah. know, I'm not putting it off, I'm investigating because it's a cool thing. And I, I have to decide if I want to change some of my protocols to work with this thing now. And and they are just everywhere. I mean, every time I, I turn around, they're, they're somewhere. And, yeah. and it's like, I mean, these guys are good. I'm thinking, man, these guys are everywhere. But other people how. are not having the same experience. That's right. So if you and I were sitting in the same office side by side with our computers, I would have different ads showing than you do. Oh, my God. And, and how does that happen? In other words, uh, how, how do you communicate to Facebook that you want to uh, only, you want this guy to see this ad? I mean, it just seems so complicated. No, oh, there's a bunch of ways. The easiest way is you put a, there's a piece of code that Facebook gives you and Google gives you that you give to your web guy to put on your website or your WordPress site. And it's called a tracking pixel. So when you're, you open that in your browser, it fires that tracking pixel. It identifies your computer as having seen that page. And it puts you into a bucket of people who have been there. So the ads will show to that if you want to look at it as a bucket full of people over and over again. If you use uh, Facebook videos, again, same thing. If you do a video on Facebook, uh, someone who's just a little bit north of you, Frank Kern is a great marketer. Uh, you watch Frank's uh, casual videos on Facebook. He remarkets the people who watch, I don't know what the number is, whether it's 15 seconds or 30 seconds, but he's determined how long you need to watch for him to reinvest money in showing you an ad again. So if you bounce off in a few seconds, he's thinking, no, waste of money. If you're there for 30 seconds, well, you're interested, but you didn't commit or you got busy or the dog barked or something happened and you went away. So next time I log into Facebook or I log in someplace else, I'm going to see his ad. And when you finally buy something, does that little tracking pixel go away? No. No. I mean, it depends how, okay, yes and no. It depends how you set it up. I mean, there's, it depends how sophisticated you are in your marketing. I mean, Google only lets you remarket to somebody for, I don't know what the exact number is. Uh, and I have to ask my Google guys, but there is a, a finite period of time. So once you're in the system, I don't get you for life. Yeah. I think it's not, I think it's 90 days. Yeah, it might be less because it kind of seems like these things taper off. But yeah. but that's very cool. And actually, for capital raising purposes and for product launches and for some of the things we're talking about, um, I hadn't really thought about email in this way. Exactly what you're saying is that uh, the marketplace doesn't know it that well. We're all inundated with email. We know email very well. But I just hadn't really thought about about applying to it in this sophisticated way. And that's what I like. Let's talk about Reg A Plus because I have guys calling me uh, they want to raise 20, 30, 50 million dollars. And sometimes it just says to me, this is a reggae plus deal. It's going to be yeah. perfect for reggae plus. Yeah. Um, you have any experience doing that? I mean, tell us what you've done. Well, I, I can't tell you the projects um, I've worked on, but you know, my side has always been on the media buying um, and the creative. So sometimes a client will provide the creative. Sometimes we'll hire an analyst or a financial writer who has deep expertise in that. And then I will go buy the media. And that's as far as I go with these guys. So we'll create the content or they'll create the content. We'll make sure it gets approved by a securities lawyer to make sure everything's compliant. We've got all the proper disclaimers in place. 
Um, I'll take that to uh, to my media partners and say, hey, you know, is this an acceptable offer for you to send out to your list? If they approve it, then they send it. And then from the backside, what I do is I do all the tracking. Did they deliver it? Did it get open? Did the advertiser do everything they promised for my client? And if not, then I'm going to hold their feet to the fire. Um, and then I'm going to work with my client. My client's going to give me feedback. So I'm not going to see what's happening on the client side. I just need their feedback that these are good leads. Um, you know, my guys are getting calls, they're getting inquiries, they're sophisticated, they meet the the criteria or no, they're not. And, you know, that's the feed, only feedback I really want is I want to know is where we're spending money. So we track every ad, every media source, and we're looking to find out, you know, which ones are the winners and which ones are the losers. And obviously shut off the losing ads that are producing poor quality leads or poor inquiries that don't meet the criteria. I've, I've always heard that... Um that these raises cost five or six percent of the total capital that's being raised. Is that is that in the ballpark? Is are those numbers holding up? It depends on the deal. Um, what's funny is it's no different than when you're trying to sell your business or sell something else. You've got a personal opinion that everybody in the world loves what you've got. Um, one way to find out uh, what the truth is, is put it out in the world and the world will tell you if they love it. So there's some, some deals where it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, people don't like the deal, they don't like the people. And that's the big thing is that I think if, you know, you're going to do this, take a good hard look in the mirror and say, okay, so if, if I was going to invest my money, would I invest in me and invest in this project? Yeah. If people go to the marketplace and they put their hands on the magic Google keyboard and they type in my name and my company, what are they going to find? Is it going to be good? Is it not be good? So, you know, you can try to fool the people, uh, which is a really bad idea because it's going to cost you money and you're not going to win. Well, that's also, it's also very difficult to do that, uh, you know, on the internet when you're doing a crowdfunding deal. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. those are the ones that are scrutinized the most. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 they're scrutinized differently than by professional investors uh, who might invest in different ways. But when consumers have gotten pretty good at doing due diligence and sharing yeah. due diligence and really figuring things out, which is, which is kind of cool. So, um, so what are, are beside, beside venture? Beside yep. crowdfunding and yep. capital raising, uh, what other kinds of projects are you are you involved in? Uh, real estate. I, I've wanted to do real estate for a long time, especially in Mexico, because I love Mexico. My family loves Mexico. And so we're just getting into that with a couple of projects now where we're helping to uh, sell um, sell real estate in uh, Mexico. Do you will you promote private placements or do you promote the real estate itself? Both. Some of the new stuff I'm working on will be the first time we've actually promoted selling real estate before it was always promoting the raise. So, hey, you know, early investor, private investor, sophisticated investor, 15% return or 18% return. They're kind of the first ones in, the first ones out before the developer starts to build. So I've worked mainly on that side. But and now you're selling the real estate directly? Well, now I'm looking at some projects. I'm looking to partner with some guys that are, that are good guys that are doing that where I can help them sell the real estate as well. Interesting. So uh, you don't promote any deals though. You stay strictly on the marketing side all the time. What do you mean by promote the deals? Become the quarterback of the deal, the syndicator, the guys that are raising the money and putting the deal together. No, no, no. I always thought you meant like on the stock side. Um, yeah. I mean, I know your little bit of your background that I've seen online in terms of your syndication, something I'm super interested in because I just love the markets. And I love the fact that over these last 15 years, I've got access to so much data it's really simple for me to pick up the phone and say, hey, I need media for this type of project, put together a budget and push the button and, and, and let the magic happen. So tell me, give me a ballpark. What's a budget? Uh, let's say somebody wants to raise a couple million dollars. What's, what's a budget that they would need to put together to do that? They're going to probably start running campaigns and you know, 25 grand a week. To, to do some testing, some heavy testing, and then sca- and start to scale up. And the reason I like to scale it that way is because anybody can drop you know, a big wad of money and blow it and go, that didn't work. So what I'm looking for is, is testing the concept, getting feedback from the marketplace, fine-tuning it, finding out where the best audience is, where you're getting the highest conversion, and then scale it up to whatever level you need. So that I come back to the client, I come back to you and say, you know, how are the leads? What are your sales guys saying? How's this converting? Um, to determine, you know, how much can you afford to spend? So I know in the real estate side, especially in Mexico, the, the real estate is so inexpensive there that the developers spend a lot to acquire somebody. So it really comes back to, you know, what can you afford to spend to acquire someone? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's almost like the timeshare business where they the, the cost of acquisition is very, very high. Yeah. But that's a reflection of risk too. You know, the, the, the risk must be very high. 
And it's also a reflection of this, the approach they take. So if you look at the guys that are in that space, almost everybody's doing everything exclusively on Facebook. And, you know, I've got nothing against Facebook. I'm tactic agnostic. I just look at the numbers. So I just want to know that for every lead that comes in, I look at the source and how much did it cost us to generate that lead. And then more importantly, the lead cost is what's the, what's the sale cost? So how much does it cost you to get an investor to write you a check for 50 grand? And so if you take that approach, it's very easy to weed out what media works and what doesn't. So we can get out of the arguing which is better. And it just comes down to which is most profitable. Um, and you invest your money there. And I haven't seen anybody um, to date that's using email to the way that I've used it for private equity for real estate. And most, I, I imagine most of your clients, uh, they're not working through broker dealers. I mean, these guys are raising money directly, directly into their own deals. Yep. Some are, and some are working through broker dealers. So some of, there's some of both. I mean, if, if they're working through a broker dealer, does the broker dealer pick up the tab for the marketing or, or is the uh, principal, the promoter still picking up the tab? Yeah. In my experience, it's been the principal. So the principal is writing the check. Um, the broker dealer is taking his piece to make sure that everything is compliant and it's paying the sales guys. But uh, typically the promoter that's paying the, uh, paying the freight for the media. Got it. Just seems like, uh, yeah, I, you know, if you're raising uh couple million bucks. I mean, I guess if you're raising 30 or 50 or a hundred million dollars, it becomes more cost effective. Sure. But at, the, at the lower end of the scale, it's probably hard to, uh, to justify. Well, it just takes, it just takes a little bit longer. I mean, you don't need to start there. I mean, what you really need to do is, um, uh, you know, get your package together, get your offer together, figure out who your audience is. And then we go to the marketplace and say, here's how big the opportunity is. There's, yeah. we have 5 million people that are potentials. So let's start with a small number. Let's talk to a hundred thousand people. Um, the great news about this approach is it's super fast. So if you're running traditional ads, pay-per-click ads, you need someone to type in a search query. So your ad pops up. Um, or you can do display ad, which means you need to stuff a banner down their throat when they're visiting your website. With email, I can get, you know, the servers will send a million emails an hour. So, you know, on Monday morning before the market opens, if you're a public deal or, you know, whatever time you want to send it, an hour later, you've got that whole audience has seen your offer. So if it's 100,000 people we're mailing to, 100,000 people have seen your offer or received it in their inbox in an hour. So it doesn't take weeks and months. Let's talk about the uh, accuracy of email. Let's talk about, you know, the open rates. I mean, you know, one of the things people have said is email marketing is dead. It's uh, people are tired of it. Open rates are, are getting very low. Click rates are getting very low. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, obviously you don't believe that because you're pouring millions and millions of dollars into it. In fact, I even read that uh, you were one of the biggest buyers of mailing lists in the whole country. Yeah. But, you know, I, I kind of hesitate whether to tell people that I like, I like doing that. Um, so yeah, I actually wrote a book about it. And one of the three big lies is that email doesn't work and it's dead. So right now, whenever there's unrest in the world place, people spend more time online. So open rates and delivery rates and all those things, uh, people are right. I mean, performance of email is not as good as it used to be. However, it's still good enough to move the dial and make it affordable. So there's all sorts of ways we can get a customer in the door for our business. And some of them are cost effective than others. Some are not scalable like others. So social media still, is, from my experience, is the most cost effective way to generate a lead. The problem with it is it's not scalable. I can't, I can't come back to you and say, hey, Joel, I'm going to be able to deliver you 200 leads a day based on social. Not going to happen. So then I can go to Facebook and Google, pay-per-click. We use direct mail. So we still use direct mail as well. So it really comes down to you know, what you're trying to achieve and what your timeline is. So email still works really well. The technology in email has gotten a thousand percent better. The stuff that's happening these days is almost frightening. So I was talking to a vendor partner of mine in the Midwest yesterday, and they have a database that's has billions of emails that are hashed, meaning they can't see the full address. And it sits in a bucket, but I can go to him and say, okay, here's my list. I pour my list in there of my list of 300,000 emails. How many of those people are on a real estate list someplace and are opening a real estate offer? And he'll give me an output file. Oh, so he can, he can help you to kind of cut and paste your own, your own data. Yeah. that's cool. So it's, it's getting more sophisticated and some of the bigger brands, like, you know, if you were working on say in a real estate deal and you get an article in Forbes magazine talking about, Hey, here's a new, new REIT or new real estate syndication deal, a great article in Forbes. Well, why don't you mail 
their list. So have your editorial guy write an editorial style email, go to Forbes, have them send out an email to their subscribers and then point them back to Forbes website. Like I've done that with, uh, I've done that with companies before and they phone me up and they go, are you sure? I noticed a link in your emails going back to our site. I'm going, yes, we paid you for an advertorial style piece on your website because oh. people like, know, like, and trust you. So now I'm going to mail to your list. So we're going to write it in the same tone as your editorial. And we're going to point that back to your site as the authority opposed to my site or a landing page. So there's tons of ways you can slice this. And it really just comes down to, you know, get a little bit creative, but test everything. Look at the data, look at the data. Well, you know, one of the things about our show profit from the inside is that we always try to work to expose the inside track. And and clearly from a marketing perspective, this is the inside track. I mean, there is, there are people who know how to restaurant run restaurants better than others. There's people who know how to do uh, other things better than others, uh, better, smarter, faster. And, and, you know, Doug, you are, you are one of those guys. I mean, you really are, this is a secret world. Wall Street, you know, where I live is a secret world. And, and yep. you know, and people, part of what people love about this show is that we pull back the curtain on some really cool secret stuff. And, and what you're revealing is, I mean, I would say for promoters, for deal makers, and even for companies that are releasing or launching new products, forget about raising money. I mean, forget about that for a second, just launching new products. If you can clearly identify who the people are that are likely to be successful, I mean, it's it's a perfect match. I mean, it really is. So well, I had a cruise company come to me because the cruise industry has uh, been affected this year. A little. And they said, uh, they said, hey, can you help us? And so I said, well, here's the data. And they went, well, it's really expensive. I can buy a list. I'm going, well, you, you're going to get what you pay for. Um, I said, so before you write off my proposal, you're going to buy a list of just people that someone scraped from the internet. That's great. That's aside from being illegal, um, it's not going to work. The list that I'm talking about is one of the major credit card companies that will send your message to their high net worth people who are travelers. And the reason they know they're travelers is because they have the black card from these guys. Well, it's like, not only that, is it, is that they're monitoring their uh, charges? Yes, they absolutely. Exactly charges are you know they can see uh, exactly who paid uh, xyz cruise line yep. so you go to a credit card company and say listen anybody who uh, paid this cruise line i want to send them a, an advertisement and and you know the question is are you going to open the email when it comes from a credit card company so that answers the question of do people open it so yeah i think know, i think they do and the way you need to think about it is think about your passions and hobbies like if you got an email that was from the mlb would you open it Definitely. Right. So, you know, if I don't know if the MLB rents their list or sells ads in their, in their newsletter, but if they did, um, that's the whole secret. The secret is that you're partnering with a brand that your consumer has a relationship with and they trust that brand and so, you're riding what, what, their coattail. What I'm hearing is that it's a Trojan horse strategy. Yes, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's a that's a great description. Absolutely. You know, you're you're sneaking you're sneaking the little warrior in there. Uh, you know, kind of all dressed up under under some other pretense, which is yeah. It's just it's incredibly smart. Is this is this a common thing that guys in your world are doing? Nope. No. The, indus- the industry talks, the, the, the industry itself, the direct marketing industry itself doesn't understand it. And the conferences and that that I attend and have attended for years don't talk about it. Yet when I get into a private conversation with the industry leaders, they're doing it. Really? Yeah. And yeah. Huh. Well, I'll tell you something, man. This is, uh, this is quite a fascinating, it's very fascinating. I mean, this has been really awesome. And I appreciate you uh, coming on, sharing the inside track, uh, helping our listeners to profit from the inside. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. Doug, listen, we'll post your uh, contact info in the show notes and, and hopefully, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, push some people your way. Well, listen, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks. Appreciate the invite. It's great having a conversation with you today. Great. You too. You've been listening to Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. For more insights and to learn more, visit joelblock.com. How about a shout out and a giant thanks to my podcast producer, David Wolf, and his team at Podcast and Radio Networks. Profit from the Inside simply wouldn't be what it is without David and his team. For more information or to learn how you can launch and produce your own podcast, reach out to podcastandradio.com. Get the inside track on 20 top business trends for 2020 from Joe Block. 
Joel's insights bring Wall Street to your street so you can profit from the inside in 2020. Just text the word TREND to 72000. That's 72000. And download your free copy today. Grab your phone and get the inside track on business trends that affect you and your business. Just text the word TREND to 72000 for your copy now.